My name is Rishi Daftour, and I'm an audio systems engineer at Pioneer. So I went to school for electrical engineering, and um, it was really interesting. I didn't know at the time that you could go to school for sound engineering. So I graduated uh, high school, and I went to school for electrical engineering. And uh, lucky me, I was like researching programs one day just because just I was interested in learning more about, you know, formally learning uh, audio and sound. And you, I was lucky that U of M had a program. You know, if I would have gone to any of the other like six or seven schools I applied and got accepted to, like my path could have been very, very different. And so once I found out that they had a good sound engineering program and good resources, I, uh, I did a cross campus transfer and I added. Um, sound engineering, so it's a Bachelor of Science in Sound Engineering to my electrical engineering degree. The, the cool thing about the program is called Performing Arts Technology, abbreviated PAT. Um, so the PAT program is, is really cool because it gives you a really broad set of skills. So not only do we learn about recording and sound engineering, but uh, we learn about acoustics, we learn about some uh, interactive design, we learn about video. And it's a broad program. And for a lot of people, that can be a really bad thing because you'll come out being an, a technology generalist. But what's really great about it is you can get a broad set of skills and then you can figure out kind of what your focus is, take those classes, utilize the resources at the university, which at U of M are fast, um, and kind of build your specialty. So then you have this really good foundation as well as the specialty, and it makes you kind of a a really good weapon at different types of jobs you might have in the future. So I added the two majors, I did that in five years, and I, uh, I had what I think a lot of people do as they approach graduating college, especially when they're not in like a, a very rock solid field that has a traditional path um, to making money or success or however you want to define it, uh, I sort of freaked out. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do next. Like I hadn't, I don't have the connect, I didn't have the connections that I have now to, uh, to sort of be like, hey, let me hit up all these people and see what types of things they can hook me up with. Or, or I had no like, you know, on the floor like mentor who could be like, well, you're really good at these things. Like talk to these five people and, and, and I think something will pan out for you. So I did a master's degree after, which is something I don't recommend for people personally unless they have a good idea of what they want the goal of that master's to help them achieve. And so I got a master's in media arts. Um, it was a good degree and I learned a lot, but um, I ultimately don't use it for any like exact practical purpose, like other than it, you know, I expanded like my learning and, you know, I learned a lot about media and I put on a really big production, which you know, again, these are all great skills to have, but I didn't implement the degree in the way a normal educational degree should probably help you. Um, and that built in some buffer time, and um, I got hired at the university. So I was a student staff member working in the studios and, um, you know, training users, um, maintaining the studios, uh, running sessions, doing video work, that kind of thing. Um, and then they hired me full-time. And so they created a position, hired me full-time, and so... Um, I did that for about three years, um, and that's where I had the um, opportunity to sort of design and build the electronic music studios from the ground up. Uh, one of the main reasons I took that job also was for the, the design and building of these world-class studios. That is an it's experience that most people don't get the opportunity to do, and so that was one major appealing point. I mean, a lot of the session work was cool, but it wasn't my ideal uh, you know, session work that I would want to like, you know, live and die by because obviously we know how, how much time it takes to, you know, to live in the studio. Um, so yeah, I enjoyed a lot of the sessions, but it wasn't like my bread and butter type of music that I really like to work on. So the appeal to sort of learn some of these design skills and studio skills and, and you know, it was a kind of a really broad, eclectic background. Um, I sort of approached the, uh, the sort of end of that uh, that path, the department I worked for was really small. Um, you know, there wasn't a lot of room to grow. And so I was looking for something else that would sort of, you know, help me align myself with sort of, you know, the sort of life goals I, I wanted. You know, what kind of life did I want to live? What kind of balance did I want with, you know, family, friends, et cetera. And so that's kind of what 
I moved in the direction of, and I utilized my engineering degree. And so I never actually thought I would use my engineering degree for actually my occupation. <laughs> Um, I thought I was going to be, you know, a studio rat all the time and, you know, live and love it. And, you know, the decisions I made when I was sort of 18 and aligned myself that way were a little bit different from my 25 or 26-year-old self. And so, um, and so I was really glad I finished it, and it's something I recommend. I still interact with a lot of students at, at the university, and, and, and I provide some mentorship for them, and it's still something I tell them. I was like, look, if you're absolutely 100% positive you're never going to use your engineering degree and you really hate it, like, it's okay to drop it. But, but if you don't know, if there's any small chance, I strongly urge you to, to hold on and continue and finish that degree. If nothing more, then you'll be really proud that you graduated from U of M Engineering, which is a, you know, a top-tier engineering program which was kind of the reason why I finished it. I was like, I kind of want to be able to say I did it, and it made my parents really happy. Um, <laughs> um, so I, I was really glad I had it, because from there I sort of, uh, I was able to, uh, if without the engineering background, it would be really hard to work in the field I work into. Most of the companies are really looking for people with an engineering degree and an audio specialty. And so having that dual combination, um, when I did my interviewing rounds, um, I got callbacks from everyone. I applied to just because they're looking for a, you know an electrical engineering uh, you know background with an audio specialty and, and having just those two degrees stamped on the resume like that's all it took to get a call back and so yeah so I so I transitioned to this role and I think I found at least from what I know right now is the only role I can see myself at this time that's like a, a traditional engineering job. And it's because it really implements a lot of the creative side and the ear training and the critical listening. So I'm an audio systems engineer. And so audio systems engineers, um, basically um, they do what's called tuning car audio systems. And it's the easiest way I have to explain to people is it's, it's a mastering engineer for cars. So I go in there and I listen to things and I see what's in phase, what's out of phase, you know, how I can make the, the signals align together better, EQ, um, limiting, compression, other things like that to try to basically make the car sound as good as it can. And it's really challenging and really rewarding because the, the car is a terrible listening space uh, with all the reflections and being small. So. It's kind of twofold. So if you're going to be more on the technical side of engineering, you know, working in jobs like I have or working at some acoustics lab or something like that, the good news about that stuff for them is that um, they're, they're smaller fields. And if you have a specialty and you have sort of the drive, um, people will be interested in talking to you. Um, on the flip side of the coin, if it's if you're trying to go more into sort of creative production work, um, the sort of advice I give to people is you have, you have really two options. You can go into your sort of local community or whatever and try to build up a reputation over time or move to one of the major cities that are doing recording and production and either freelance or start from the bottom up, do good work and cross your fingers because it's a whole lot of luck in addition to... Uh, in addition to talent. And, and, you know, I truly believe that if with enough time, people will recognize your talents and skills. You know, it's not a completely losing game. Uh, I'll say this, is that if, if your interest is in that area, like, there are really cool jobs that people just don't know about. Um, I had no idea some of the cool technical jobs that were available. Um, and that's true, you know, even for, um, I mean, I'll start with where I actually know a little bit more about, which is automotive. I didn't know that you could do cool audio engineering for automotive applications. Um, you know, I think I have probably the coolest job in that area, which is the systems engineer, but there's also people who are working on infotainment systems. If you're interested in programming, you know, understanding like the different links between all the different elements in the car as interfaced through the head unit. It's, some of that stuff's really interesting and with that type of background, um, you could potentially move in some of those directions as well.
I, uh, I try to go back to the basics. <laughs> so very similar to um, when you're mixing something, right? If you're, if you're working on a mix for a long time and you've been, you know, maybe you're an hour and a half or two hours in, you're like, this thing just isn't gelling. It's not coming together. Sometimes the best thing to do is throw all the faders down. Start from the basics, start from scratch, rebuild your mix. Same kind of thing. Um, go back to the basics. What do you know? You know, what are you trying to solve? What might, you know, be the problem you're tackling? Uh, sometimes starting from a clean slate is good and just build it back up and, uh, you know, everything related to this type of work is like building a house of cards. So start with your, you know, your bottom row and, and build it up and sort of figure out, you know, what's working, what's not working. And sometimes you'll have to do it iteratively, you know, it's like, hey, I got my left and my right speaker working and then I added center and now I have to go back and fix some stuff in left and right to make that whole system work. But you can tackle it, you know, sort of one thing at a time. I mean, same thing is true, right? If you're looking at signal flow, something's not working, in the, and you realize, you know, all of a sudden I hooked up everything, now I have this big buzz, you know. Start back at the microphone, check your cable, check your tie line, check your preamp, you know, et cetera, et cetera. When we actually do tuning weeks, um, depending on where the manufacturer is, um, so our, our customers are the OEMs, so, you know, Toyota, Honda, GM, Ford, the, the big companies. So um, a lot of that is uh, located in Michigan, so some of that's not, but, but other places aren't. And so for that type of work, um, I'll travel to their place and I'll be there all week and, you know, there'll be really long weeks, long days um, when you do that. And yeah, I mean, I've done traveling for work. I've, I've toured and stuff like that too, so it's been traveling. If you live in an area that requires transportation, um, you're likely listening to music more in your car than anywhere else. And so to have a, you know, a, a good listening experience, you know, just to be able to enjoy it. It does not have to be like, wow, this is this pristine, amazing thing. Listen to my silky highs, man, in my car. It's amazing. That bass just hits you. But it's just, that's your everyday experience. And so to sort of just be like, well, this is integrated into my life and this is something I like and enjoy. And, and the audio system I'm working on, you know, allows me to, to hear what I want to or get what I want to out of this experience that music is a part of. I have definitely built up some mentors over time and the interesting thing is actually when you talk, when you give the same problem that you're struggling with in your life to multiple different mentors and you get not necessarily conflicting responses but everyone would approach that problem differently and so they give you different sets of advice and still at the end of the day you sort of have to, to figure it all out and so, you know, um, I'll talk to my parents on one hand and they'll have one set of advice because from their standpoint, they're very interested in me being stable and, uh, you know, having a lot of like the, the life stuff and the family stuff that they obviously have figured out at this point. And then I talk to some of my, you know, my audio professionals, mentors, former teachers, uh, judges for different competitions I entered who I've kept in touch with. And, and they have slightly different advice because they're in the field that I'm trying to work in um, and so, you know, most of them tell you to sort of follow your heart. It, it comes with a lot of other territory that I think specifically students don't think about. And I think it's important. It's okay to follow your heart and chase your dream and passion, especially in an industry that doesn't, you know, afford a lot of people a lot of money. Um, but just understand that that's actually going to be your reality unless you're like the 1%. You know, it's probably not the greatest idea in the world to bank on being that 1%, but I think you should strive for your goals and dreams, and if that's what it is, go for it. I've always really struggled with the, the difference between uh, who I am and what I do, <laughs> um, because for probably the first, I don't know, maybe 25, 27 years of my life, I define them as one and the same. And I still live my life a little bit that way. So I, uh, so I spend my, you know, 40 to 50 hours a week at Pioneer, you know, designing, tuning car audio systems, doing some sim programming and simulation work. And then um, at least three or four days a week, 
I go home where I've built up a home studio, a pretty nice one. I can do 16 channel, you know, full bands and everything. And three or four days a week, I'm working on that, and and that's fun, and that's kind of the way I tied together, you know, what I always thought I would be doing, with finding a more stable way, um, to sort of live my life. You know, having the, you know, I realize that, um, you know, future down the line, you know, oh, cool. when um, I get married and, and maybe have kids or whatever, I don't want to be in a studio 16 hours a day. Uh, but some of that comes with the territory if you want to be good and, and, your, and your business is hopefully doing well. Um, it's a really hard thing to do. And this has sort of been my, you know, my reconciliation of those two things that I've been sort of at odds, odds with is I have a stable job that still engages me, that still builds up my skills, that's still related to audio that I, you know, like I, I actually really like. I don't hate it. And then I can go home and I can do a, the thing that's like really creative and like work and with artists. And, you know, I don't have to take a crappy 14-year-old metal band uh, just to keep the lights on. Um, that's the way, you know, I, I internalized it. You know, I, I'm sure studio owners have a much different perspective than I do that I'm just not aware of because I don't have a separate facility that I have to, you know, keep running. Um, trying to find a balance, again, is, you know, work-life balance, especially with anything related to audio, I think is just really tough. Um, I, I, st I really struggle with it because I'm so interested in so many different things between, you know, doing, I do some, you know, audio for video post, but, you know, my friends are like launching a new web series and uh, I thought it was really, really interesting. There's no money in it, but I signed up for it and I love it and it's great. And then I'm recording bands and, and, and then I have my full-time job and I'm about to get married and, you know, there's, there's just a there's hundred things and there's, you know, my family likes to hang out a lot and they live close by and so just finding a way to balance it all, I'm still navigating it. I'm still making lots of mistakes by overcommitting myself. I think your passions can help you guide your career, um, but in making the decision to make your passion your career, understand what's entailed with that. Um, you know, this, the same thing is true. You know, if, if you're going to, you know, if you're going, like, I, I use this example all the time. So it's really easy for a student. If, if there's a student not on scholarship, not on, you know, not on financial aid or whatever, they can easily accrue over $100,000 of debt. And if you're going to become, and you're going to school to become an audio engineer, and you accrued $100,000 plus dollars of debt, um, and you're trying to go into, you know, like creative studio production, like, I don't know when you're going to be able to pay that off. Um, I mean, you, you feasibly could do it, but it's just... You might, I mean, I'm not advocating that people don't go to college. I'm just saying that, like, you might, if that's what you really want to do, you might be better off going to, you know, a trade program or just something to get you started and involved in studios to learn the basics and then go intern, even if it's for free. You'll make out better in the end, probably, if that's all you care about. Now, the cool thing about the four-year programs in the Bachelor of Science is you're getting the circuits background. You're getting the acoustics background. You're, you know, you're learning how to, troubleshoot and problem solve and, and learning some of the engineering background that are applied in technical capacities later on. Those are, you know, employable skills that have a little bit, you know, more of a, you know, a paycheck, to be honest. Um, so just think about what it means to do that. You know, it, today's world, especially with politics and everything, it's crazy. It's nuts. Um, Maybe education should be free for everyone and everyone should have really good paying jobs after, but the reality, at least now, which is 2016 for all of you watching 50 years from now, um, is, is the student debt is really, really high. And though I think people should be able to study what they want, the people who got you know a lot of the liberal arts degrees and things like that, um, a, a lot of my friends are struggling and are really crippled by the amount of debt they're in and there are potentially other ways to sort of get the balance you want and just think about that as you approach college or you know your your future endeavors and careers touring was awesome um i highly recommend it for anyone that thinks they can handle the road even for a little bit and when i say be able to handle the road i mean like 
weird hours, Saturday every day, that's good and bad. Um, being able to use like gas station bathrooms um, like every day, um, et cetera. Like a, if you're not with a huge band, like eating a lot of fast food, like I highly recommend everyone in their early years who has a capacity and interest should do it. Even if it's just like a one, you know, three weeks, four weeks out, whatever. Um, I've done some touring. The, the the most major tour I did was um, I was front of house for um, I Am Dynamite, and we were um, opening for um, the North American leg of the Sum 41 tour. Um, this would have been 2012 or 2013. Um, and it was my, and that tour was actually my first tour, which was awesome. So I did I think we did five and a half or six weeks. Um, and the biggest venues I've ever worked in, you know, everything from, you know, they were everywhere from like 500 to 3,000 person club tours mostly. So I didn't have to hang a PA every night, which was fantastic. Um, and it, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. And I think there was a question, uh, that was on your sheet that was sort of like fake it till you make it. Um, so I had done a fair amount of live sound in like bars in the area, and um, we had a video studio at the university that I worked at. Um, and so I did a lot of front of house, but those are mostly like 100 seaters or less. Excuse me. Um, there were 100 seaters or less, and here I am like, and, and, and we had a very prescribed sort of workflow that might not have been normal, especially being in the university environment. And, um, and I was the house tech, which means I put it together, which means I knew how it worked. So you know, whatever quirks there, we, I had to work around based on this gear and we have two different ground planes and you have to patch this stuff here and this other stuff there. I knew that stuff. You're on tour, new board, different board, different crew, every different venue, every single night. Um, and so that's really cool. And so one thing it was, I still remember the, the first date, like you just don't even know how to interface with the house tech. Like like, what am I supposed to ask them for? What am, like, I know what I'm supposed to do. I know how to mix the show, but, like, it's all the stuff around the core task. And so I, uh, I remember, so, like, to sort of, like, pretend to, like, learn the room or whatever, I hung out during some 41 sound check, and, and I, like, watched. And I learned a lot, actually, from, from their front of house engineer. He, 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 t he, didn't, he, he probably doesn't know it, but he taught me so much. I can't have been... <laughs> Uh, begin to explain it, but I just watched and I saw all the things that he asked for <laughs> and all the things he did, and I literally just copied it <laughs> when it was my turn. Um, I was on a different board, a different setup, and I was like, yeah, like, I need this, 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 and this, and I want the center cluster set up like this off this matrix, and I j it just copied it. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, after, like, four four nights in a row, you, know, like, you just pretty much learn it. It's like, okay, like, these are the reasons why I want these things, you know, and it became, like, you know, like clockwork. And uh, at first I was, you know, I used to get a little bit nervous, you know, right before like the hit of a show or whatever. And after doing it for five and a half weeks, after like the second week, it was like, I could like get up out of the van. Like I just woke up, I just walk in the venue, like, all right, sound check, here we go. All right, I'm ready to go. Like it didn't even matter. Like it was just like baked into you. Yeah, so um, the guys in I Am Dynamite, um, they weren't my close friends at the time, but um, they, uh, when I was in school for a class project through another friend, they knew these guys and I had a recording project and so I recorded them and, you know, I kept in touch with them. We're Facebook friends and they decided they were going to do it for real and they're still touring and, and anytime, you know, they have either small legs or uh, stuff around like Chicago, Indiana, or Michigan, I still do all their front of house. I still get to do it. It's, it's really great. Um, but they, uh, yeah, so, you know, a couple things fell through for them. They needed someone to go out on the tour. They didn't know a front of house, um, their current front of house, who is one of my friends who sort of set me up with recording them the first time. Um, when he couldn't do it, he said like, Hey, maybe try call Rishi and see if he could do it. And, uh, I almost declined, which is the other thing is cause I had a full-time job at the university. Um, the university is a little bit more flexible than other jobs, but, because of all of that, and I had my own video production company at the time, you know, like I almost declined because there's just too much going on that I would have to like leave behind. And again, it's one of the greatest things. I'm so glad I did not do because um, it worked out really well. And, uh, and I had a really good time and I learned a lot. And,